This uh, tutorial is uh, part of a big line of courses and uh, state-of-the-art reports I made with my uh, colleagues, my collaborators, which became a huge amount of text in the end, and I'm giving you some kind of a contracted uh, introductory level talk relating to this subject. So let's begin. First of all, the material and also the slides are available in the repository for the course that we already gave in the past and we also give in SIGGRAPH, inside of which it, there is a directory called SGP Summer School. And there is also a directory called LibDirection for some of the demos, but I will also flash it again when relevant. Okay. So, as part of an intuitive introduction to directional fields, well, this is how they look like. Let's see what we're seeing here. There is some kind of information on a surface, which is both directional and flowing. So every point here has several direction that you can go on to flow along those lines. Usually in every place it looks like a weave, which means you have all, you always have four directions to go to. Either a sort of an up, down, left, right, or the other way around. But there are some points on the surface, also called cone points, like you've seen before, that are not like this. They are some sort of a stitch, which means here in this point you have three direction. And here in another point, you have five. So that is on one leg what directional fields look like. But let's go in more, in, a little bit more into details, what they are. OK. So first of all, the word field means the assignment of a vector or some of these directional entities per point of the surface. So there is uh, one of those guys for every point of a surface. What's a point in a surface? That's also part of the problem we will talk about today. But this, in this case, is continuous. So it looks like this. Of course, even by looking at it, you can already see the flow of this uh, vector field. For instance, if you follow the lines, you see there is some kind of vortex around this. And you can see a sort of a cone point, a point of singularity here, where the vortex starts spinning around itself. You can also see that this thing is kind of symmetric, as the surface itself is symmetric. So a lot of stuff you can only see by visualizing this thing. But this is still a single vector field. So there is a single directional entity per point. Something else I should say, and this will be throughout this tutorial, we always talk about tangent vector fields, which means every point has a tangent plane, and the vector field is within the tangent plane. There are no normal components. Usually. People omit the tangent and mean, mean just that when they say vector field, although it's not always the case. So, what you've seen before was something that I had several directions of moving at a point and they kind of did not matter. So there was an entity who told you, well, you can move either back or forth. There is a direction, but not a specific one like up. There's either up or down. In this case, where we have two directions which are perfectly rotationally symmetric, we have a two rosy field. In this case, which flow lines you've seen in that slide, we have a four rotation of symmetry field where we can move in either of the four orthogonal directions and we don't distinguish or discriminate between them. And then it's called a four rosy field. I should say that um, while these things are generally defined continuously, it's not an information that actually exists in continuous differential geometry. You cannot just open a book and talk about these kind of things. You might, you might find some luck in branched coverings, which is a subject that is really hard to read about. But this kind of thing kind of came from computer uh, graphics backwards and not the other way around. So there's not a lot of material on this, on, on, on their analysis. And this is also part of the reason we did this tutorial, to somehow consolidate a lot of uh, ideas, relevant ideas. Good. But though all those were symmetric. What if we don't want symmetry? Even, you know, as a math exercise, but not only. This also has an application. So in every point, we have several directions. We don't discriminate between them. So not that one direction is one, the other is two, the other is three. But they're not necessarily symmetric. So they don't have this ability. In this case, and in the general case of any set of vectors per point, we call it a directional field. Okay, that's the name for it. So the questions that I'm going to raise more questions than answer for which today is how to create uh, and analyze them. Okay, you can see for instance one example here that shows several stuff. For instance here on the cap of this uh, 
half sphere. You see a six rows here. I hope you are able to see it in the back. Yeah, so this is kind of symmetric here, those red points. There's all kind of direction, but when you go here in the boundary, it's sort of degenerated to a field with four, di with four directions. But these directions are not symmetric. There are only two asymmetric directions. Uh, symmetric direction with an asymmetry between them. And then there is somehow a smooth interpolation between them. So how do we do these kind of things? That's something I'm going to answer today. OK. This does not need usually a big introduction because it's very easy to know the merit of vector fields and flow fields, especially in nature. We see them in magnetic fields. We see them in design, for instance, illustration. We see them in this, uh, well, I'm not even sure what's the name of this alternative medicine thing. Let's call it the chi lines. I just made it up. Okay. In electric fields and even in hair growth, your hair is some kind of field. It's not necessarily tangent, but maybe the directions of the roots somehow tell something about it. And hairs even have singularities. There's the lick, I'm not even sure how it's called, the point where the hair grows from. Some people who even have different ones, it's also genetic. So, how do we actually use them? So those were examples in nature. Often in computer graphics, we're trying to imitate something that we see or somehow follow some example. Well, the prominent example and one that we, we talked about uh, later today, even in the next lecture by Marcel, is meshing, which means we have some kind of notion of directional fields on a surface. We want to create a mesh such that the mesh will sort of follow this kind of thing. So it will look like a discrete parameterization of those flow lines. This is the actual parameterization, and this is the mesh that uh, applies this kind of thing. Of course, then we have to follow what kind of rules, where to put singularities, how much singularities, and this thing transcend from directionals to actual meshes or parameterization. So I will not take this point any further. This is just like a motivation for the next lecture. Okay, one other example. This was actually historically one of the most earlier examples to use vector field which have some kind of symmetry. As you see, 2000. And you, as you can also see, it's not a very old uh, venue of research. Illustration. So how to capture a surface with directional fields or the flow lines in some kind of way that will be able to show you the, the merits of the surface, the geometry, without showing much. For instance, this Klein bottle is a very good example. You can actually see the geometry here, although not much is illustrated, just because of some very strong directional fields in several places, which somehow flow with the geometry of the surface in this sense. Okay. Of course, there is another work here about stripes. I will also mention it uh, a little bit later, which can also be used for illustration as we parameterize some stripes. This is a four rosy, and this is sort of two rosy. So we can see the surface, but in another type of way, uh, with the description geometry, which capture more, more of the um, elongated kind of parameterization, for instance, like the arms, then otherwise here, where we have a force symmetry. Good. One example, which is actually not used very often for this kind of case, although I think it should, is the formation. It means we have a source object, we have a target object. You could model the formation by, well, simply put a vector field that takes source vertices to target vertices. And in this case, when we model this kind of deformation, instead of talking about how much the surface deform, we can talk about how much the vector field induces deformation. Okay, so this has been done, maybe in less in the context of directional field, a little bit more often in the context of functional maps, which we don't have, think have a tutorial about in this uh, grad school. Tomorrow. But tomorrow, oh, good, yeah. Then another forward pointer in this case. Okay, not specifically this context, but uh, this in is included in this sometimes in this context of uh, functional maps. Recently, uh, I mean, my, my question about the deformation, um, maybe say that this is defined by a vector field, it's an instantaneous one then? I'm not going to get into this discussion, it's just the application. Yeah, there is both instanta instantaneous, I can never say this word in the first attempt, and 
not. For instance, vector fields can be used also for collision detection often. So you measure deformation, but not as how the geometry changes, but how globally the scene changes. Okay, so this is like a general tool for this kind of stuff. All right. One other example, which is, and as you can see here, it's sort of something that relates to meshing, but not only, it's a little bit more general, is constructing objects of architecture, where we care how vector fields flow on the surface. For instance, I don't even have to show you the vector fields of these things. You can see them by the flow lines of the mesh. But there is more than just meshing in cases of architecture. For in, there are constraints. Constraints, for instance, mean that we want this to be made of glass panels that are flat. So the vector field, the actual parameterization, those flow lines, have to be in specific angles to each other and related to the geometry of the mesh to make it work. So that this object could be made of flat glass panels. This is also the case for this, just harder because it's a hexagonal mesh. But not only. We can only also use vector fields to describe the way uh, a structure behaves uh, with stability, which means how much the forces and the pressures are distributed within an object if we build it in a certain way and with a certain mesh. So that are also usages for uh, uh, directional fields in design of objects, other than just the meshing process. Okay. Of course, vector fields are being used more, uh, let's call it, uh, conservatively in things like data analysis. Everything that has a flow has a directional field. For this case, I think it's traffic congestion in cities. So they measure not only directions of the congestion, but also like densities, so which is some kind of magnitude. And then when they analyze this, for instance, they can decompose it to see where are the pressures most at. They can see how to design the uh, cities, how to do urban planning such that this will be optimized and so forth, of course. Okay. The other uh, side of this kind of thing, not only analyzing, is actually, for instance, urban planning. We have this and you can even here see the vector field. You can see where the roads go, you can see the way the buildings are aligned, everything that requires alignment is some sort of vector field. Even how to change the look of the lake, if the lake itself is artificial, to make the, this neighborhood work. And what does work win? Well, that's the interpretation of the actual algorithm. But everything that can be described by some kind of vector field problem, alignment or otherwise, is subject to this type of design algorithms. Okay, so let us dive into the problems of, or the challenges of how do we both create, represent, and analyze these kind of things. And the first problem we're going to touch on is discretization, which colloquially means where do we put those things? What is every point on the surface that I've been uh, mentioning so far? I'm actually kind of running. <laughs> yeah, I can slow down. OK. So this is already a lie that all is well known in the continuum. We know a lot of stuff about single vector fields. We know how to transport vector fields on a surface such that they are considered parallel, like as in the plane. We know the resulting holonomy or curvatures, what happened to vector fields when they go around cycles. We know an index theorem, which means how much singularities can I have in the sense of sum. And this is also something I will talk about. But this is things we know in the continuum, and this is a little bit less so. We know this for single vector fields, but again, there's not much theory of continuous rotational symmetry fields. So this was actually one of the points we touched a lot in the star, and I will touch here. What exactly are singularities? How do we measure them, and what do they do in the case of uh, directional, which are not a single vector field? But you can already see some kind of intuition. So this is what you would call regular. There are four directions everywhere and simply everywhere, even in this point in the middle. This is some kind of singularity where I took one square out, threw it away, and connected the rest. Don't worry, I also have props to show that, but not now. We will tend to the subject later. So there are only three directions. It kind of connects around itself. And this is where I took the square I put from here and glued it here. I added an extra square. So I have five directions at this point where this goes. Okay, it looks like a pentagon. 
And I can do that so forth infinitely, just keep adding squares to get more and more singularity index. Uh, this is actually a negative one, so it's less and less. Here, of course, I'm bounded because if I keep eating out squares, I will end up with nothing at the end. Don't worry, this is just an intuitive description. <laughs> we'll, we'll work over it a little bit more formally later. So, the big challenge in the discrete setting is that everything is discrete, which means we have tangent planes. The tangent planes are not continuous. We have some vectors here, some vectors there, and we don't know what happens in between. We lost those frames of the movie. Okay, so this brings out several problems, some of which don't exist in the continuum setting at all. So problem number one, connection, which means how do we compare? How do I know how similar this vector field to that vector field? Which also brings the question of what is parallel in a parallel transport? What are equal vector fields? So that's problem number one. Problem number two, which is specific to direction of fields where you have more than one vector per face, is matching. So imagine I have several vectors here, several vectors there. I want to compare vectors, but to compare vectors, I need to know who goes to whom in this sense. This is matching. Now you can look at this and say, well, if I have a connection, I know what's parallel, I'm, I will put them somehow together, parallel, and I will say, yeah, there is a notion of closest angle, right? I can see it. Some vectors are closer to others. And of course, since this is symmetric, then the angle here equals the angle here and equals the angle here. And it's probably how I want to match. Well, this intuition is not wrong, but it's not the solution. It's just a solution that we will talk about. And also, what happens in the case where it's not so close or it's not so symmetric? We need to take care of this case as well. And lastly, the complementary problem is interpolation, which means, OK, suppose this vector goes to this vector. Am I done? No. Even if you decided this vector goes to this vector because they have the smallest angle, it doesn't mean that this is what the point meant, which means I can go from this to this like very shortly, or I can do a lot of full rounds in the middle. So go from this to this, or this to this like this. Now you would say it's ridiculous. Why would I want to do that? Sometimes you have to. And it's also sometimes prescribed, which means this is the way to go. It still doesn't make any sense, but you will see why. OK. At this slide, I will actually limit the things I'm going to talk about. The, one of the biggest problems in discretization is choose where the vector lives in the sense of either on the vertices, so every vertex has a vector, Every edge has some kind of representation of a vector. For instance, one of them is the most popular discrete exterior calculus, where you integrate uh, vectors along edges and give a single number, and that's the representation of the vector. And the other is face-based, where the faces are trivial, natural tangent planes. And then we just put those vectors like painted on those tangent planes. What I'm going to say now that we are not going to talk much about these two, OK? The reason is they have implications, differential geometry implications, which are not related to what I'm trying to convey today. And I refer you to another course, which contains a lot of material we don't have about what's the purpose of discretizing in that sense, what's the implications. So now we're going to talk about how to represent directionals in this case. All right. Well, discrete connection, the first problem, how to compare between any direction nodes or even simply just ve matched vectors with different tangent planes. So you have a tangent plane here, a tangent plane there. How do you actually compare between them? Well, the most, let's call it natural method, and it also reproduces things like the discrete Gaussian curvature and a lot of other stuff, is say the following. OK, so you have this face where the vector field is painted upon that face, and you have the other one. You can just flatten them out to the plane in this way. Okay? For instance, if they are two adjacent faces like you've seen before, in this case, I just take this flap and flatten it out. I can always do that without any distortion because it's just a single flap. And then I just compare what I got on the plane, simply Euclideanly. 
So it's also very natural to what you see here. I'm kind of taking this vector and floating it around here, bypassing the dihedral angle and comparing. So that's basically on one leg the problem of connection, how to compare things. Now, often, and, and uh, as I will talk later, we have a representation here which is two-dimensional, which means related to a local base. And here another one. So in order to make the comparison, I also have to transform the bases. So there will be a single base. Okay, we'll see that in some formulas here, and I will say that this is what we did when we did that directly. But that's sort of not a problem if you know in advance who's the, who is the base. Sometimes. Right. So I will actually jump to the third problem of interpolation. So we have this abstract tangent plane and this abstract one. Suppose we flatten them out or something. It doesn't matter. We still have two vectors. And the two vectors are represented exactly like you see them. I don't have any angle information or otherwise. You just the vector you see. So what happens in between? So the most obvious, let's call it the natural choice, is to do the shortest rotation. Which means I think that what happened in between is the least effort kind of way. Okay? That corresponds to this angle of rotation. And because it's the natural one, or a little bit more mathematically, oh, spoiler. <laughs> well, I can show it again this time. <laughs> we also call it the principal choice. Principal because it's always between minus pi and pi. If you have some kind of rotation and you take the shortest rotation, there's always th this kind of choice. Okay, now let's show it again, although you have been spoiled. Right. It's a bit on the slow side, though. <laughs> so the other choice is also valid. You can do this kind of thing. It took me forever to create this animation, like more than the entire set of slides <laughs> put together. Okay. How does this choice differ from this choice? Well, my constants is that I still have to go from this vector to this vector no matter what. So I have to, if I have to enumerate all the other choices, it's by a rotation, an extra rotation of 2 pi around itself, to one side or another, which I can enumerate by some integer number k. So, yes, if this is my principal rotation, then the other one, the all the possibilities for k are called period jumps. Okay, this appeared before in the literature, but somehow this didn't get actually get a name, so we had to invent one. Uh, I hope it's a good name. <laughs> okay, so in lack of any other choices, you have to say this is the rotation. It has an extra degree of freedom, and this is the degree of freedom that you get, unless you encode it directly, and therefore we go into the biggest motive of today. So, if you only know the vectors that you see here, and you need to assume something, like make a choice, somehow make a single angle, you would say, well, I take k into zero. I use the principal thing, okay? These kind of methods where you only see the vector and you have to assume this kind of stuff are called implicit method or Cartesian method because you actually have the vector. Now, if you are given the period jump, or specifically if you are even given the rotation altogether, someone prescribed it or you computed it in some kind of way, then your, the method you are using, the representation you are using for this is explicit or polar or angle-based. So you're actually dealing with the angles directly. Okay? So I will repeat those much because uh, most of the methods I will show today uh, are either this or that. And all their disadvantages and advantages are kind of complementary to each other. Okay, of doing either this or that. All right. By the way, um, I think I will have time, famous last words, so you can just bother me with questions in the meantime, because the subject will change. And uh, if you ask, excuse me, 70 slides ago, you said that uh, it's going to be less efficient. All right. Now let's deal with the second problem. Now, the second problem is kind of new because it just didn't have to be dealt with in the past. Before, we used uh, rotational symmetric fields, and it was kind of, yes, we use the closest angle if, if we have to do 
implicit matching. That's also kind of principle, right? You use the smallest rotation angle, that's principle, so we can do. But what happens when you have stuff that kind of look the same, but they're not the same? But moreover, this rotated a bit to the left, this rotated a bit to the right. Well, what's, what am I comparing here exactly? Okay. So first reduction, we do the matching in an order-preserving way, which means I only have a single choice. If I put the red to the red, then the blue goes to the blue, and the green goes to the green, and that's it. That's my matching. I don't flip otherwise. So that reduces the set of my choices really considerably. Okay. This is just the other possibility to choose. Now I do, you know, I even change the colors accordingly, so I don't need to explain. Okay, and possible choices. But what is the best one? How do I reduce it to what you've seen before, to this principle and this? Well, for this I need an extra insight. Okay. Instead of a closest angle field, which I don't really have here, I will talk about something called the minimum effort which means how much effort I have to spend to make the blue into the red or otherwise. Okay, so let's see how we measure this effort. Well, simply put is exactly how much I need to rotate, but I use it in a signed way, which means I have a delta one, and then delta two is measured like a minus because of this, because I have to rotate backwards. And then delta three is rotated this way. So if I add them up, I get the effort of this matching. Okay, this is how we measure the effort. Right, okay, why did I uh, measure it this way? How does it help? It helps because this is, I want to, for instance, choose a matching or define what is the matching which is principal in this way. So what's the difference between this matching and any other order preserving matching? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. I add again a two pi which is very nice for me because I can just use the definition I've shown before. Now, how do you see it? If I do a matching red to blue, and I instead want to do another matching, like go one click forward, the price I have to pay is a two pi rotation, which means take every blue to every blue. It's just composing this on the former one. And of course, I have a K to do that, so because I can take it one click back, one click forward, and so forth. Note that this also reproduces this shortest angle thing in n rosy. It's exactly the same. So if you have two n roses which are kind of close, and you can click it one backward and add a 2 pi effort to this. So the other one costs 2 pi, and then already gives me the answer. If all order preserved matching differ by multiples of 2 pi, then I have one which is principal by definition. So if I only have the red and the blue implicitly as a Cartesian, and I need to choose who goes to whom, I'm taking the one that does the principal matching. Now there's a very annoying caveat here. Look at why I use the uh, bracketed squares here, but the rounded squares there. Because you can have exactly something sitting on the pi or on the minus pi. And it's indistinguishable. In this case, it's usually like a sampling problem. It means you have two vector fields which are really, really, really different from each other, so different from each other that you lost the quantifier of the big rotation between them in some kind of way, okay? For instance, when does this happen in NROSI fields? Any idea? This is kind of hard to measure in this kind of fields, but if I have two rotationally symmetric fields which are exactly on the pi, how do they look like? They're totally bisector to each other. That means that you don't know how to rotate them into each other. You have two valid choices, to go forward or to go backwards. That's exactly the case. It's kind of hard to see that in a non-symmetry, but it will still be sort of bisectorish in a way. I mean, it's just dependent on how much this is very anisotropic in a way. Okay. Now, this was about two directionals, one against each other. So for instance, from this to that. What happens around cycles? Now, around cycles, a directional must return to itself because it just, it's just there. So if I'm matching this somehow to that, and there's a matching this to that, and matching this to that, and matching this to that, and forward, all the vectors return to other vectors, right? It just has to be. But it doesn't mean that they return 
vector per vector to the same place I began with. Yes. So the here is one example of a matching of one vector, okay, blue to blue, and then suddenly I reach another vector than the one I began with. Okay, and the rest uh, subsequently, up to a different matching. In this case, I call the cycle singular. And how much I did not reach the original vector, how many clicks I went left or right, is the index of singularity. Now for this, I have props. Carefully done with uh, cutting and pasting by hand. Okay, so this is a regular cycle, okay? Nothing happens here. I go blue to blue to blue to blue. That's exactly what you've seen before. Unless you want to get creative with the matching, which you can. But let's say principle. Oh boy, yes. Now this is what we call a plus fourth, which not surprisingly also looks like the corner of a cube. So I'm going from this green, uh, matching it to the exactly parallel this green, and then exactly parallel this green. But then when I go back, I end up at the blue. So there's one uh, pi over two rotation to the left, and that's why it's called a plus fourth, okay? When we do vector fields on, for instance, cube objects, they will have this appearance, this kind of seam, okay? So, but you can also see something else that I said and I didn't say. Uh, this mesh was kind of flat, okay? So this vector field induced a curvature, I even have the exact wording, which is flat, okay? The angle defect is, is exact. When I did this, I induced positive curvature, where I lost exactly pi over two of the curvature by having an index one fourth. And we have the other way around. Uh, spoiler, yes, this is the five. So I added another square to this. I created an, a surplus angle and therefore negative angle defect. And if you follow the one, I sorry, I cannot do it backwards, but I can pass it around and you can play with it forever. Okay, and so I, since I added another square, there is negative curvature and I have index minus four. Okay, this is a bit of an unnatural singularity to some people because of the mismatch, but it's still the complementary to the cube one. This is maybe a more natural singularity that appears in nature. This is a minus one half, it's six squares, okay? This is a more natural singularity because this is usually what you see with principal direction fields. They have this kind of singularity, this uh, where you have two directions up still, it's and two direction down, it's like a stock hyperbolic example, okay? I will pass them around now that I'm done with it. Please don't kill them. It took me like 10 minutes to make. <laughs> yes. Now, can we have whatever singularities we want on the mesh? Like put a defect here, put a surplus there, and so forth. Sort of with one condition. The sum of all those indices, those numbers, have to add up to the natural topological sum of indices according to the genus of the mesh. In a closed mesh. You will forgive me, but I will not discuss boundary much today because you can have like a full tutorial about what happens with the boundary in these cases. There are a lot of subtleties uh, that I don't want to go into. So in the case of a closed mesh, you have to sum up to this. For instance, in a cube, you have exactly eight of those which sums up to two, if they're one fourth. Okay, and you can count up how much you see in that uh, um, rocker arm I showed you in the first slide, and it will also add up to do zero, actually, because it's genus one. All right. Now, what's the problem with principal matching? It, I kept putting it up as some kind of nice option. You always have the, you take a vector and you take another vector, they're close by, why not use the smallest angle to rotate between them? Why am I making trouble and saying, yeah, but, Formally, you can also have a 2 pi rotation and so forth. So why am I not doing it? The answer here is sampling, which means if I have some kind of field, which naturally has a high order singularity, I lose the information about the singularity. I just give someone the field and say, yeah, you have the field, get your own principal matchings everywhere, 
and show me the singularity you got from those principal matchings. Well, this is what you would get. The reason is because we have two little triangles around every cycle. The amount of rotation we can encode is pretty low. So if you look at a field and the triangulation is much lesser than the information you see, you can sometimes even see with your eye, it will create what we call a singularity party. Now, the sum of indices will still be correct because altogether around everything, the sum is correct, the sum of indices. But locally, you will see these kind of patterns. And it also really, really depends on the triangulation. Okay. So yes. Are you saying that in the example on the right, principal matching was assumed? And yeah, I gave you just the lines, and I told an algorithm, compute the principal matching, show me the singularities you got, and this is what it gave me. And on the left? Yes, the same. same. The same. It's just a little bit better sampled, so it's kind of OK, but it still didn't make the correct one. It gave you four minus ones instead of a one central minus one. OK, you just chunk them together. OK, and this, well, OK, you say, why do I care? Fine. But for a lot of algorithms, for instance, meshing, when you have a lot of singularities bunched up together against triangles, it's going to be a problem. You're going to fail with a lot of algorithms. OK, so this is an actual problem. Sometimes you cannot use some vector field and take the principal matching, and it's going to be OK. You have to do something else. I even have a demo about this. Yes, you see the vectors, right? Uh, OK, so what I'm doing here is prescribing a singularity. And then I'm computing the vector fields by angles, which means I'm prescribing the angles in some way, which I will also show a little bit later. OK, good. Now I will increase the index of the singularity. This is the opposite by a lot. Yeah, and you will see it kind of becomes noise. You still somehow, when it's pretty low, you can see the lines. But as I go up and up and up and more index rather than the same triangulation without subdivision, it just becomes noise. The rotations between every two triangles are way more than pi in this case. So if I have to show you what the principal matching is like, white is just regular, and this is the singularity party. I, f I threw away the knowledge about the singularities and got the, ac the principal one. So you see it's kind of nasty, although it's nice and symmetric, but still. Now, as a sidestep, if I constrain those faces and told them, please do principal matching as nice as possible, I get this kind of thing. But that's a spoiler for later. It's not what I'm here to show. Good. Then this is about discretization and sampling. And now I will go through to a problem I kind of prophetized but didn't talk about much yet. And this is the problem of representation. How do we actually represent those things in a way that we can actually work on them as an algorithm? So the usual problem for which all the representation models have been done is comparison. And specifically, comparison in the sense that I want two vectors to be alike as alike as, as each other as possible when they are adjacent. So in this case, I even, we even drew it to a vector field base for diversity. So I want these two vectors to be as similar as possible to each other in some way. But what does that even mean? OK, well, this is the problem of Dirichlet, which means minimize differences between neighbors. What I don't really have, even if I have a connection, even if this problem is totally planar, is the following, the minus sign. How do I compare between them? I need to have a representation. I need to have numbers that represent those vectors that I can compare between each other. And those choices will make a lot of difference. Principal matching is one of them, but we'll see a little bit more. OK. In the case of what we call a one-directional or a simple vector field, to that case, the most obvious representation that is kind of the classic one is Cartesian, which means there are two ways to do that. Either an xy, which relates to some local basis on a tangent plane. So we have a local basis on the tangent plane, and then we span it. And then we have an xy. Or extrinsically, this one was intrinsic, where we have the xyz, just the coordinates of the vector, nothing more. This is the most raw representation possible. So this is one. The other one is polar, which is still some sort of related to, to the Cartesian in a way, in a logarithmic way, which means 
We have a local basis, but we represent it instead of intrinsic two coordinates, we represent it with polar coordinates, angle and a magnitude. Right. But this is the same vector. Okay. Okay. So let's take another stock problem and see how it's represent how it's uh, featured in both representations. If I want a field which is not a vector field but a direction field, which means a field in which I constrain or model some kind of unit length in this sense. What do I do with Cartesian field? How do I make them be unit length? Well, I just have to. Because they have those two degrees of freedom. A direction field has only one degree of freedom because it doesn't have any length. So I have to constrain this. And this is a rather bad constraint for most of the time if I have to use it like this. Okay? In the polar case, well, I don't. One coordinate is just one. And that's it. Or I just don't use it and use the angle instead. Okay, great. Let's use polo for the rest of our lives. We don't like Cartesian in this slide. Okay. But as you will see, it's not really the case. Okay. Now, fine. If I want to compare those unit length, this is not exactly unit length, but it's poetically unit length. Okay. I just minus them. Okay. If I made a connection between them, I made the bases be the same in some way, and then I minus them, and if it's zero, they're perfectly like each other. What happens in the polar case? Well, they look like the same vector. There's a 360 degrees between them, or 2 pi. But when I try to compare things, I don't get a zero. Okay? Which means this one on one face was 45 degrees, and this one on the other face was 405 degrees for some reason. Okay? Now we'll say, who cares about this? Why, why did I even get this kind of thing? Why can I make everything 45? But it's not possible. Because if, for instance, I start making up a field by some kind of flow, and this is 60, 90, 120, and so forth, and suddenly I'm getting into the big numbers by this flow, but you know geometrically that it wants to return to the same vector. It kind of looks like this, but now I cannot compare anymore. These are not smooth. I have a branching problem. That's exactly the classical problem with polar systems. They, they are nice, they represent angles, they represent directions well, but you have a branch. That's always the case. Also, every time in geometry where you want to interpret rotations with actual axis angles or things like this, you need to know which two angles are you comparing against. One type is to know, okay, but there are other ways to handle this. Yes. One of them, for instance, is to say, well, I locally reparameterize, which means I take them locally and I know that the difference is like 2 pi, I can factor it out. And therefore, I know these two are 60. Okay? Or otherwise, I can encode this difference and make it go away in some kind of way. Okay? Locally, of course. You cannot do it globally because you just move the problem around. Okay? Yes. So. How do I move the problem around or factor it out? I'm saying these two are equal up to this modulo. Okay, if I want those directions to be the same, it means I'm kind of need to remove that. And the way to remove that is to encode it, which means they are, to me, equal if the angles are equal up to some 2 pi times an integer, which means I have to introduce another guy to this relationship, the integer. And this already looks like what I've shown you before, the ability to choose the period or to encode it in some kind of way. So this is an explicit choice. This is why I put explicit and polar in the same way. These kind of things get encoded in this kind of way. OK. Right. Yes, for instance, in that case, I can assume all of these are 60 because there's 60 under this integer. For, uh, for every case I know, every local reparameterization. All right. Now, as a last word about this slide, it's actually a lot of slides together, so don't worry. How do I convert between polar and Cartesian? And this will actually appear a lot in different, uh, several different contexts. Well, the usual way, 
Yes, I just take the exponent. That's why I also mentioned the word that polar is actually a logarithmic representation of Cartesian. And when I do this, I lose that. And that's exactly the point. Cartesian methods don't encode this kind of K. So the conversion between polar and Cartesian is uh, only injective one way and not the other way around. Unless you consider K as another variable. Let's talk a little bit about comparing those bases in some kind of way. So I'm assuming there is some kind of encoded rotation between those bases. And for instance, for Cartesian methods, it means that to compare two vectors in two different bases, I have some kind of rotation matrix that encodes how much one base goes to the other base. Okay? Now this is written in a kind of non-symmetric way. As you will see a little bit later when I talk about complex field, there is a way to separate this rotation to there is some kind of global basis between them, and they both rotate into it. That's somehow a little bit nicer, although it doesn't really make a difference, because the norm of this thing is 1, so numerically it's not doing much. If you need to compare with some kind of least squares kind of thing. Okay? What do I do with angles in this case? Well, just the same. I take this in the polar kind of way. I compare between them. and. I have to add, in addition, the angle of the transformation between the bases to do that. Plus, the usual guy, which now got a different name, so they got a different guy, P, which is the period jump. Okay, it's a different name because otherwise it's a little bit confusing. Now, there is something I must say, although it's really actually hard to understand. In this case, where you work like this, the fact that P is zero or non-zero does not mean principle, because the base vectors itself are vector fields. They also have period jumps between them. This also contains, although it's a constant, it kind of contains its own internal integer. When you move it around a cycle, it will encode some 2 pi rotations. Okay, this took me forever to understand. So it's kind of a hard point. But when you encode things like this, don't expect to turn those into zero naturally. It, does, it will never work like this, because the bases also have singularities and such. OK. Right. Now let's move a little bit on. This was all about the single vector field. What do we do with n directionals? First, let's touch the symmetric case. One thing we know about the symmetric case is that it doesn't really have much information, which means I can look at, if you look at one vector, you've seen them all, for instance. The rest are just two pi over uh, two rotations, or whatever n is in this case. We usually work with four here. So for instance, the option of using all of them, like in a row way, is kind of redundant. I don't really need all of them in this place. Yes, this is just what I said. So it's one option is using a representative. So only encoding one of them. But then I have another problem, which can be solved by usual means. If I have two of those that are kind of the same or similar or comparable, something I want to compare, what happens if the representative of this thing is this and the representative of this thing is that? It's kind of unfair because I cannot compare the representative up to a 2 pi and expect this to happen because there's an extra degree of freedom here for the comparison. Luckily, there's not really. It's just that instead of comparing them up to 2 pi times k, I'm comparing them up to a pi over 2 pi over n of this. In this case, a pi over 2 rotation. So nothing happened. It doesn't matter who my representative is. Because my period jump now encodes a quarter of a period jump instead of a full one. Everything else is the same. Okay? This quarter also, if you go around the cycle, will give you the quarter singularity in this sense. Okay, that's why we call it those names. So here is one example of this. Yes. And this is also this is a quarter singularity because it will goes one to the left. And this is what you see here, actually, this kind of cycle if I put it up as actual vector fields. All right, that's possible. That's a nice one, still using uh, things. OK, uh -huh. I even chose the right one. OK, so yeah, that's what I said. I simply add up the possibility to also rotate internally by n to make this happen, and usually 
And this is also historically the first way to represent, uh, I'm not actually sure there was this uh, Zorin stuff they did use for things, but the first way to synthesize directional fields with free n directions was done like this. This was encoded up to divided by n. All right. Now, let's look at a little bit something that will give us a little bit of motivation to the forward. If I use a Cartesian representation, okay, one of them, and I look at the angle, so instead of using a single representative that re does the sinus of uh, theta and the cosine of theta or the other way around, I can just multiply the angle by n and get a 2 pi invariance, which means I can use the sinus and the cosines of these kind of things and still get a single representation of the entire thing. Okay, that's another way to do representation in Cartesian field, not use the actual angle, but kill the invariance by using those two geometric functions. So this is our notion of representative in the Cartesian way. Okay? Instead of actually comparing those two, I'm saying they're equal if when I do this operation on both, it is equal. Okay? And then I don't need an integer anymore. So now we begin to like Cartesian methods more after I did a full commercial on why polar is nice. Suddenly Cartesian looks nicer. Phew, we don't have to use those integers things. Okay? Despite the disadvantages that you will see. Singularity process of it. And this is something we call the representation vector. All right. So here is one example, for instance. OK. So this was the original one. And this is taking the representation vector of one of them and then interpolating. But this looks like a mess. But it's not really because we kept the rotation accordingly. And therefore, when you suddenly turn it back again to a cross field, it looks nice. Because this is smooth, although this is not, because we encoded a cross field symmetry other than the other one. Okay, so it's nice. Now, for the last problem of a representation, again, what happens if it's non symmetric? Then, yes? Hold on. <laughs> I, I, I keep waving the representation to polar is nice, Cartesian is nice, and so forth. Yeah, it kills it, and then it's wrong, because you have to assume principle. Yes, yes, of course. So let's do the, the final, uh, let's call it a representation problem. What happens if you have just n directionals? There's no symmetry. There's no assumed symmetry, although we want to encode symmetry in some kind of nice way, because most fields will be kind of symmetric, otherwise they're not entirely useful. Okay, so we still need to compare one of those guys to one of those other guys. How do we do that? Well, it's obvious I have more information, first of all, which means there's n there will not be a single representation. Since I have the full degree of freedom, I must have at least the amount of numbers I used just to represent every single vector. Nothing else would do. But I don't want to use those numbers. For instance, it will force me to somehow encode the matching in some kind of way. Can code it in an integer way? Well, probably yes in some way. It's not entirely researched for the general case, but it's going to be extremely difficult because you have to keep the matching and then you have to keep a lot of integers for this kind of thing. So one integer was bad enough. Do we really want to keep four? Well, maybe. Okay, I'm not judging, but we don't have those methods uh, yet. So how do we compare when we don't want to know the matching? So I want to know this creature and this creature are kind of alike without actually doing the matching or encoding it and comparing, which already spoils that I'm trying to get into something Cartesian to represent this kind of thing, and you will be right. Okay? This is another possibility to match. Okay? So what I want to do is to have some kind of function that takes this into some kind of pile in which I will not care about the matching. It will be some kind of geometric a uh, comparison between one guy like this and one guy like that that will be like good for all possible matchings in some kind of way. So I need a function that boils those down. Well, of course, there are a lot of ways to do that. Okay, do we also have need something symmetric? But the choice, well, for now to do that is to say the following. Right. If 
we take these things and we consider them as roots, complex roots, because let's imagine it's in the complex plane, of a polynomial. The polynomial, first of all, encodes them by the roots. If I give you the polynomial, you know them. Okay? But it also loses the order. So if I take one polynomial and another polynomial and I compare them, the polynomial of ui and the polynomial of uj, it will give me results that are kind of similar to each other because it lost, lost the matching in some kind of way. So this is a way to encode those things such that it will be comparable. This is the representation vector in some kind of way, the one I showed you before. It's not only saying this, it actually is, but let's see that. So what do I mean by representing by a polynomial? Do I give a function? No, Represent polynomial is represented directly by its coefficients, which means if I open this thing up, I'm getting a lot of coefficients, and as you will see, they're totally symmetric, and not by chance, because you are not supposed to differentiate between the order of the roots. Okay, I just use them as my representation. Okay, as uvw, those are the numbers I work with. Those are my representative vectors. Now you'll see I have been a little bit inconsistent here, because here I only have three roots, and here you see four. Okay, it's just not, to show four stuff on the screen. Yeah, it kind of looks a little bit nasty. So imagine I only have three here to show for this. Uh, otherwise, I would have four coefficients because I have this degree of freedom. So in this case, I'm encoding uh, a three directional. Okay, and this is my function. This is something called an n polyvector. Okay. Fine, so that's a representation vector. You can work with those instead of those, and everything will be nice. But this is also an extra niceness in this kind of thing. This actually already encodes the symmetric case. When you have a complex polynomial where all roots are symmetric rotations of each other, this is just a polynomial with only the free coefficient. So, yeah, this I already said. I want to somehow gloss it a little bit, gloss over it. So when this is zero, and this is zero, and this is zero in a polynomial, and this is sum of them to the fourth, which means the symmetric case, okay, that means that this n direction is symmetric. So when I use those coefficients as my representative vectors, the case of n roses symmetric are a linear subspace, and even a simple one, I just have to take those things to zero. So it's an extra niceness in this kind of case. And not only that, but the only one who is not zero, this thing, is actually my Representation from before, the one that I took to the fourth, the n theta, one I used. And you can even already see it. This equals to that. So I have this four theta thing. As a reminder, this is exactly this kind of representation, just used as complex number instead of sine and cosine. Nothing more. Okay? Oh, a difficult problem. <laughs> well, let me talk about it within the demo, okay? Because, but yes, we encode a magnitude here. It's a degree of freedom. You can use it or you can not use it, but it's here and it's causing troubles, as you will see. Now we keep not liking Cartesian again, okay? So this is some kind of uh, summary, which I gloss a little bit over it because my time is going forward, okay? I just wanted to see that this is, for instance, uh, an interpolation for an angle-based or a polar method, which means I know the rotation between them, I encode this with an angle, and then I interpolate those, for instance, fixed in this face and this face, and interpolate somehow linearly, smoothly, whatever, in the angle space, and then I get this. This is kind of nice, okay? And also, I didn't use magnitude, so the magnitude is just one for this kind of thing. But, and this relates to your question, this is what happens when we interpolate representation vectors. So what did I do here? I took this, took this to the fourth to get a representation vector, and again did this with this. Now, question. How does the representation vector of this correspond to that of that one? In complex numbers. This is, an answer, uh, this is a question I already answered a little bit a while back in a different manner. Yes, this is, this is the minus of that, exactly, because they're bisector. The rotation between them, the effort is exactly pi. 
So this is some number, let's say the magnitude is one, complex number with some theta, and this is one with a minus theta. Okay? Now what happens when you linearly interpolate two complex numbers which are exactly opposite of each other? That. There's a zero in the middle. So it, if I'm saying, okay, I want a unidirection field, and then I go about my business interpolating with the magnitude, the entire representative field, and then I normalize, that, is it good? Well, depends on your definition of good, but it's not that helpful in this kind of situations. Okay. Now, argumentatively, you could say, well, this is a mathematical problem. Yeah, I just interpolate the things that are really different from each other. Okay, but Cartesian method cannot handle this kind of thing because they're so principal. That's the thing that answers the question you asked a while before, no? <laughs> yeah, I can. <laughs> but, but this is extra complicated because it, this looks like a uh, subdivision of the wall. Okay, yes. So this is what you get, and I will actually show you this effect in the demo, which I hope we are going to get to soon. Okay, so I will, forgive me, I will run past for this, go a little bit uh, about alternatives, and then go forward. Okay? Now, I keep saying, well, there's this Cartesian thing, complex stuff, n theta, and so forth, and there are nemesis, the poros systems, where I actually encode the theta and so forth. So these are like two huge methods, Autobots and Decepticons. Yeah. Okay. But there are other alternatives. There are other factions. They are good for several different stuff, but usually they're a little bit more uh, limited. For instance, one of them is kind of like the Cartesian method, where it encodes a field as some kind of function which has extremities like the directionals. This is sort of exactly like Cartesian in 2D, but in 3D it makes a difference. You could use spherical harmonics for that and other things. But you can also encode this as some kind of eigenvectors of tensors, but then you have problems with singularity. Or you can just encode directionals with a functional representation, but this is, again, a teaser to another tutorial and others. There are many other representations of directionals that we cannot categorize as either Cartesian or polar. Uh, that's it. Now, let's talk a little bit about what we do with them. So that was discretization, where we put them. How do we solve the problems of discrete? That was representation, how we represent them as objects. But representation always had the problem of compare. But why do we need to compare? What's the objective? What are we trying to get from these directionals? Okay. The most common, I would say even like 95% of the works, do have the following objective, as parallel as possible, which means uh, give me a vector field, directional field, such that it's constant throughout, which means every point and every neighboring point look as much as possible as each other. That's as parallel as possible. Okay, a lot of methods use that. Some of them use other energies as well, but they always begin from this kind of thing. The reason is that this is exactly the Dirichlet energy, minimizing the gradient of the vector field, wanting to make it as constant as possible with the comparison. So it's just taking all the comparisons I've shown you before and try to make them as much as possible true. So they, they give you zero. Okay. Now, how do we do as parallel as possible? I simply enact on what I've shown you before the way to comparison. So in angle-based approaches, I take the two angles and I compare them up to the matching, this integer, this period jump and everything I've shown you before. Okay, this is what I do. All the energies you will see do exactly that when we talk about this kind of thing. And in Cartesian or complex approaches, which are the same, complex just not using trigonometric, I compare representatives. That's all to it. Since I have two fields, I create a single representative, and then I keep working with the representative as if I'm comparing a single vector field. Matching problem disappeared. That's how those methods work. Okay? So you see a lot of works are in this faction, and a lot of works are in that faction. In total, it's like 10 people, but okay. Although it has a lot of names. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about other uh, possibilities to other objectives that we usually want to achieve. In the case where we're not using n roses as the representation, but some other directional, often 
even if we have some constraint like this, we want the rest of the field to be as orthogonal as possible, not to degenerate or something. So this is one objective that we might want to have. It's very good for meshing. So if you have a field which is not very orthogonal and you're doing the meshing according to those directions, you're going to get very skewed quads to this end. And if you're using something a little bit more orthogonalized, you get nicer quads. Okay, also in the case of this work, which they did uh, meshing from some kind of illustrations in 2D, but this will also be covered in another tutorial today. Okay, other objectives which are also very important are alignment to features. So for instance, if I have this cube as an original and I want the field to be compared on it, then I want the field to also match this uh, jump in the cube. Now, it's a little bit more difficult than I showed you before, because how did I compare stuff? I said, let's flatten them, compare in the plane, and move on. That means that I actually don't entirely see the cube as a cube, unless I'm really here. That's where you get those kind of results. What do you do? You compare extrinsically. Okay, so you also involve the normal, and then you compare the full 3D field with the normal to another one. And then you can get this kind of thing, because if you involve the normal as the directional, then you actually get a constant field throughout. It's some kind of field that looks like the cube and it moves. But that's as much as I'm going to say about this. Okay. One other objective that I wish we do more with is to say, okay, as parallel as possible means I want to get a vector field which is as constant as possible. Geometrically, it's a little bit like trying to get maps that are as isometric as possible. In some way, you're trying to make everything with a constant um, distortion, okay? And if you have some kind of methods that want to do that with a mesh which is highly curved, you're gonna get a lot of cone singularities to do that, as Kinan talked about, but this is in a different context, so though it's his work, okay? If you use some kind of other energy, for instance, an energy that minimizes somehow of conformality, which means the vector field does not have to be some kind of gradient of a map which is isometric, but something that is more conformal, you might get a little bit less cones while doing that. Because for instance here, you see when I f integrate the flow map, it gives me quads that wants to be as much as possible the same as each other, but here it allows them to scale a little bit to get this effect. All right. On the other way around, we might want the vector field itself to actually induce isometry, okay? So if I want to design a vector field on this vase, just the vector field flows in the direction where isometry is preserved. So it's kind of a vector field that encodes the symmetry of the surface, if you want, in uh, some kind of way. Um, okay, for instance, in the case of the vase, it's good for having some kind of texture which is also symmetric and nice and isometric, or in this case, it's good for deformation. Okay, now, Another objective which is related to something I shown you, I talked about in architectural geometry, specifically in the case of quad meshes, is to make those glass windows flat. So orthogonality is not enough here. I need something that relates to the geometry of the surface. And therefore there is something called conjugacy, which means I want the directionals I make on the mesh in a way such that both directionals will be flat according to the second fundamental form, and I'm not going to talk about what it actually means in this kind of sense. I would just say that it doesn't mean they are orthogonal unless the surface is a sphere or something umbilical. Okay, it means that if I move through one direction, so the other direction, when it moves with me, it doesn't change. Okay, so it's sort of infinitesimally planar. It means that when I move on one line here, this line and this line keep on the same plane. Just infinitesimally, that's the definition of conjugacy. Okay, so that's a very important thing to have, but they cannot be always orthogonal unless they're the principal directions. And we cannot always design with principal directions, it's not enough degrees of freedom. So this was actually the motivation to why polyvectors were invented, and that's it. Let's talk a little bit about constraints, and then we will move to a few demos. So, other than actual objectives, we assume what we want the vector field to have is what we need the vector field to have. So these are things you must do, even in a soft way, but a little bit less software than energy. One of them, and this is like the as parallel as possible of constraints. So this is the constraints usually people usually want to have, which is alignment. That means 
that fine, get me a vector field, but it needs to align to certain features. This is a little bit of an artificial example. Most likely, for instance, you would like to say the vector field is always orthogonal to the boundary or something of the sort. Okay? For instance, if you're meshing the boundary this way, then the quads align with the boundary or something else nice. But this is usually a constraint, alignment. Okay? So you want to have some kind of illustrations to guide the vector fields or the resulting meshing on this kind of mesh. So you just draw them and illustrate, and you expect the algorithm to respect or as much as possible or directly those alignment constraints. Okay? Now, in the case of directional fields where you have several directions, you might also want to expect partial constraints, which means, okay, I have lines here, but I want the, the vector field to move here orthogonally, but here I want it to move in this direction. And I don't want to say this is direction one and this is one as well. I want to have the vector field to magically mix them up into something nice. For instance, if you see here, you know it's going to be a four-directional that somehow connects between them. That's what you most likely would like to have. Okay, so here is a problem which is kind of caters to Cartesian method in some kind of way. You already know one root of the polynomial and you want to get the others. Okay, so this is the case of partial constraints and in full constraints, you have to supply everything, which means you actually have to supply all the numbers in one phase. One other constraint, which is very popular, and actually the number one constraint of polar methods in some kind of way, is topology, which means it's a little bit less about alignment, although it is about them, and more about where do we put the singularities of the mesh. So I want the cone points to appear in specific positions, and I want the vector field to respect these positions. Now, why is it the constraint number one of polar? Because it caters exactly to how polar is built. You have the angles, you can do angle sums of things, you can prescribe exactly how much rotation a vector field goes around everything. So this kind of thing is quite easy to do in polar methods, <coughs> while in Cartesian methods where you don't encode this and you have to rely on the mercy of principle matching, it's actually impossible. We don't know how to do that in Cartesian methods, it just doesn't happen, especially for high order singularities. Okay. There is, of course, actually, in the beginning, there was some kind of mix between them, although this is a polar method, to say, well, I don't want to give the singularities in advance. I want the sums to be created on their own. So I encode those integers as variables and let them, let them be smooth. I kind of solve in as parallel as possible, and the singularities are achieved in the correct places, more or less, up to this nonlinearity of the energy. But this is something we'll discuss a little bit during the upcoming demos. I will just finish with constraints. Can you yes. If you want uh, similarities to Cartesian methods, can't you simply construct a branch cover where you have the branch on both sides? Yes, you could, but that's kind of uh, polarizing the Cartesian in a way. Because you kill the branch, then therefore you kill the problem of polar. So you already have the jump, right? Having the jump, so why do you need Cartesian methods anymore? Uh, the entire point of Cartesian method is not to deal with the branch cover. Yeah, so you can already work poor, it's linear. Anyway, so we don't need this. If you also want magnitude, you can just interpret magnitude differently. Yeah. Right. One other constraint, also a very nice one and needed, is symmetry. This is something I haven't touched on. So as parallel as possible methods don't naturally guarantee, although it's kind of implied in the geometry, but of course not entirely, that if you get a symmetric mesh, then the vector field on this side will be exactly a reflection of the one on this side, whether extrinsically or if there is some kind of intrinsic thing. For instance, if I deform the leg but still keep it isometric to the original, I still want this to work, for instance. So uh, actually, what's already classic methods don't handle this really well. This is something that is handled, uh, state-of-the-art handling of this method is a few functional maps. And this is something I guess you will hear about today a lot. Okay, other constraints, which also are related to singularities, are differential ones, which means we want to dictate either the divergence of a field, which means the flow of a field around some kind of area. Okay, so actually give, I want this, the field to flow here this way, to flow this way, the density of the flow. The flow is a very uh, ill-conditioned word, ill-defined word for this. 
Okay? This is, for instance, a lot very useful to simulations. So you dictate exactly how much density goes from where to where, and you can also use this constraint to make conservations. So you're saying the density in a lot of things don't, doesn't change when you move. This is something that's not promised by methods to the geometric uh, direction of it, just like that, of course. Not necessarily. Another one is constrain the curl of an object, which is actually interesting. Curl is how much an object rotates around a small uh, loop. It's actually exactly the opposite or the J of divergence. Usually, we don't care about the curl itself. A lot of the time, we care about making a directional field which is curve-free, which means it doesn't have any curl at all. Why is it important? Because objects that are curve-free are integrable locally. So if you take the vector field and you integrate it into a parameterization, it's a little bit what you see is what you get. Okay, the actual parameterization really, really aligns nicely to the lines. A lot of times, the way to integrate, and I think we will talk about it later, is a kind of, you do a Poisson equation from vector fields to parameterization, you get something. Nothing is promised. So if it's curve-free, a little bit is promised. Not everything. Depends on what kind of parameterization you want to achieve. Right. Now, I will go through, well, that's exactly how much time I need, more or less. Three demos that exemplify some of the things, how to choose the right method. But le first, let's talk about what are we doing when we're choosing the right method. So first of all, well, choose the type of object which is kind of, what do you want to do with your life? Yeah, well, what do you want to achieve in this case? Every object does something else. If you want conjugate fields or you just want flows or you want orthogonal or you want a free rosy field, which nobody ever found a usage for, five rosy fields, maybe you will. Okay? And then you have to decide on your objective, what you want to achieve and the constraints you want to have, the guarantees. Okay? And then it's already a little bit not up to you in some way, unless you invent a new algorithm. Some algorithms already imply if you're using something Cartesian or polar. For instance, if your constraints are more topologically, you probably need something polar, if your constraints are more, uh, well, alignment type and you don't know the topology, you wanted to get it on your own, you care about other stuff, you care that the system will be more efficient, for instance, as you will see, you're going to choose a Cartesian method, probably. Also partial alignments. Okay? And then you also have to consider if what you need is face-based, vertex-based, or edge-based. It's important. It also changes the dimensionality of the problem. Yeah, this is something a lot of people uh, Ignore. Right. I will skip this a little bit because it's a little bit like things that were this, they are said in the past. Right. So, in the case of fixed topology, how do we compute the field? So, I gave a singularity at some point in the cycle. I want to compute the rest of the field, which means I want to compute the angles. Okay, how do I do that? It's actually pretty simple. If I have the singularities, I'm going to say, the difference in the angles around the cycles have to sum up to the singularity. Okay? That's my constraint now. And, okay, constraint is nice, but what do I want to get as a field? As parallel as possible. Don't count my singularities. <laughs> I, might get, I may get them wrong. Um, I want a field which is as parallel as possible, which means I want those sums to be achieved around the cycles, and everywhere else, and also actually here, make the field as smooth as possible in the angle case. Okay, so even if I encode the matching between the, the vectors or so forth, everything else, but it leads to a, an objective which is as parallel as possible. Okay, so now, how do I do fixed topology with n directional field? I don't. <laughs> There's no actual way to solve this problem directly. Which means I can have my single representative vector field, okay, it's a single number, but I cannot do angle sums. It's not a possibility. Okay, unless I actually encode the angles in the end. Which means I can tell it to have a singularity, maybe, but not even where. I can just tell it, well, close up, but then singularities will just appear on their own. I cannot have specified topological features. So this is a slide telling you you cannot do something. 
in some kind of way. How to prescribe? You don't. Well, future methods will somehow have to deal with the fact that by the sums, we mean the sums in the principal rotation, and somehow induce the principal rotation to understand the angle sum, but not otherwise. Good. OK. So in angle base, we just solve for the angles. OK. A lot of the times, and in one of the demos I will show you, this is just amounts to a linear system, because we know the angle sums or the difference in the angle sums, and this is the system I will show you. And anywhere else, the difference in the angles have to be as small as possible. So a quadratic equation with a linear system. And this is exactly the first demo I'm going to show. I keep thinking the slide is going to come up, but only now it does. <laughs> All right. So what do I get as an input? I get the original vertex curvatures, which means I basically get a mesh. Okay, so I'm getting how much naturally, if I parallel transport a vector around the cycle, what do I get back to? Of course, I don't get back to the original vector. I don't get even back to the original direction, or it's just off, because there's a curvature. Okay, unless the curvature is somehow a cube, which is magically already 2 pi divided by n, but it's usually not the case. Why, what do I need? What do I also get as an input? Something the user gave me, which means the singularities, where to put them, and this means what they add up to. What's the angle sum rotation? Okay, that's what I get from the user. I have to get them from the user. Okay? And what I give back is the difference between this and this angle. That's what I give back. That's the output of this algorithm, also called trivial connection. Okay? It's called trivial connection because it actually uh, makes a vector field that returns to itself, a direction that returns to itself. This in the case of the original curvature, is not trivial because the vector field goes off after a cycle. Right. And the objective is as parallel as possible, which means of giving the difference in angles between this and that, but I want it to be zero. That's my wish, which I'm not going to get because I have specified sums around some cycles. So this is exactly the system I'm solving. As parallel as possible, so difference between them, which is as little as possible, while prescribing specific singularities. So the angle sum around specific cycles have to be something. Some 2 pi divided by k, uh, by n times k, which relates to the number I want to give. And this is, <sighs> yes, number one. I don't know which they are anymore. I kind of have, ah, it, it, this is already it. Yes. Great. Now, it will keep showing zeros if the field is not relevant, which means the sum of indices is not correct. How do I put singularities? I forgot. Yeah, increase index. OK. So this is a plus one. Plus one. It will make something like a cube. Plus one. Plus one. The field is still not correct because I haven't put enough singularities. Plus one, plus one, plus one, yes. Ah. Plus one. I think I made this one bigger, too big. Yes, it's too big. Ah, yes. Now you see, already see a problem of this kind of method. You have to put exactly the same the sum of singularities to match. If you lost by one, the result you get is already not well defined. So what you see here is the field I got. You see, really away from singularities, it really behaves nicely as parallel as possible. But on the singularities, you can even count. The angle sum is exactly what I prescribed. Now, I can, of course, add and remove singularities as much as I want. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So here. Yes. Okay, now what you're seeing is actually aliasing. Because I put way too many indices here, it masquerades as little indices in the visual because actually between every two pair, there is a huge rotation that you are not seeing. Yes, it's encoded in the actual representation, but it's not seen. Okay, that's already uh, a view to the other demo I showed you. Now, if I'm going to take this and show you the principal singularities as in the other demos, you're going to see a mess. The singularity is that this thinks it has. Okay. 
So you can play with it for hours. It already exists online. Okay, I put I press 12 times, so this is an index of three. So it means it, this is actually a six pi rotation that you are not seeing around it. And the other one as well. Right. No, we're getting close to the end. Yes, not this one. Yes. One way to do it, which we don't have implemented yet, okay, but we will in the near future, near zero to infinity, okay, is doing angle based, but without encoding specific topologies. So we want the angle sums around loops to be free. That means that this system with the period jump is encoded directly where the period jump is a number. So I'm telling the system be as parallel as possible, okay, without the constraint of angle sum, but try to have this integer such that it's parallel as possible and put singularities in several places. And this was one of the original methods to create directional, also called mixed integer optimization. Okay. The problem, although it's a very general method and also polar, I think it's also the, the only free uh, topology polar method is that you have integers. So you need to work with mixed integer systems, which is both highly nonlinear and also not that easy to work with. All right. Now let's see, and this is, I think, going to also to be this our second demos. What happened when we have implicit topology? So we're in the Cartesian realm now. Okay, there's principle matching. I just have some constraints, like alignment. I put some vectors in several places, interpolate them somehow, which I will show, and then let's see what happens. Okay, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm trying to minimize the difference between the representative of the neighbors. That's what I'm trying to do. And then you already see it's actually computationally nicer because I have a single representative. I'm not encoding any integers. I'm just having something minus something and let it decide. Okay, so it's gonna be a linear problem because it's just the Riclet energy. It's such a quadratic minimization with a global optimum. But again, limited expressivity. Okay, now, I think this is an actual demo, yes. What I will do is one method to do it, which is also go globally optimal directional fields. Okay, I will just, yeah, it's exactly like the same. My input is I put several numbers on faces, several complex number, and they are actually the, the set of roots, the n rows, like the ones I showed you before, up to the power of n. So I encode it using a single representative. That's what I give as uh, an input to the problem. And interpolate it to the rest of the three faces. How do I do that? Simple harmonic interpolation, nothing more. Okay, minimize the smoothness on the energy. It's a quadratic problem. Okay, and this is it. You're seeing here two things. First of all, comparing faces. And this thing you're seeing here is the rotation between the bases. I told you before that you can do it one-sided or both-sided. So this actually takes the numbers to, the, to a common base or geometrically, the way the edge, the common edge is spanned by both bases. So I can be I'm able to compare them. There's also a small thing here to see that I'm taking it to the power of n because I'm, co I'm not comparing vectors. I'm comparing things that are vectors times the power of n. And it's important, actually. Otherwise, it's not a power transport. All right, let's see that as a demo. Let's even hope it works. Complex. It might. Great. So this is now just zero, okay? I will put various fields. Yes, this is one, and this is the interpolation. As you see, something weird happens. It looks linear because I did something linear, and it also mixes the magnitude. So here I have some constraint, and here it goes to practically zero around the corner, right? Because I'm not using a polar method. I did not, I, I threw away the usage of angles. So I can put a constraint here. Fine, it's a little bit better. I can put one here. I can put one there. Suddenly it becomes nicer, right? But still, this is the unnormalized version, which means this is also what happens to the magnitude. I can normalize. It still looks nice, but look at the effect that I've shown you before in vitro, which means the one line. Let me show it to you. I can rotate. So see the difference when I rotate. 
You see, it's kind of mechanical. Part is rotated nicely, and then suddenly there is a jump. And now, how do you see this jump? This is because it's normalized. There's a zero in between. See, when I rotate, it reduces the magnitude to avoid interpreting the rotation. That means I'm over time. But there's one demo, so, and that's it. OK? That's exactly what I showed you before. That's the problem of Cartesian methods. One problem. That it has, when you mix this kind of things, rotation is not entirely nice. But hey, we solved the linear system. Uh, well, this is what you get. By the way, these are the singularities. Yes, I pressed the correct number. <laughs> so these are the implicit uh, principal singularities. Okay, let me show you some singularity party. For instance, I put one here. I put one there. I put one here. I start rotating them. Hmm, not much of a party. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is a bit of a party here, you see? So you even see something worse. You have two pluses and a minus instead of killing a plus and a minus together. That's because that's, there's a sampling problem here. If I normalize, you will see a little bit of a mess. That's what principle uh, matching gives you. And if I put one constraint here, for instance, I try rotating it. You see the singularities move wildly just because it's a thing. And it's also dependent on the uh, uh, wellness of the mesh. Good. Now, I think the final, yes. The final one I'm going to show is polyvector, which is actually exactly like the demo I showed you before. Just that instead of a single representative, I will be interpolating the entire set of polynomial coefficients. So I, make, I take the roots, boil them into polynomial coefficients, and then just compare between them to interpolate. Still, a linear system, but not one. There is one pair degree of coefficient. Okay? And what's nice about it is that if I have a totally symmetric field, which means all of them over m below 0 are 0, because it's a harmonic interpolation, I will get 0 throughout. So this is something I want to show you. But not only that, harmonic interpolation is also bounded. So if I kill the symmetry a little bit, it kills it a little bit around the mesh. Not much. The, the result is pretty possible to, to uh, predict. Polyvector, built, polyvectors. Uh, this is different because I have to dev press different buttons. Yeah, let's put one symmetric here, one symmetric there, one symmetric here, one symmetric there. Everything is totally symmetric, which is all the coefficients, but the last ones are zero. That's why everything will be symmetric, by definition. Okay, now let's start killing the symmetry. Now this is complicated. Yes. Right. It is complicated, apparently. <sighs> ah, okay. Aha! Yeah, I'm playing with single vectors. All right? So as you see, the symmetry is kind of very cute here. But because this has all coefficient 0, and this has all coefficient 0, and this all coefficient 0, and this is something, then it harmonically interpolates the unsymmetry from here to here. And I will normalize to show the effect. But since this is still a Cartesian method, you will get this weird rotation effect. And let's indeed see it. Uh, if I, OK. Yes. If I kill the vector here, you see it doesn't change very uh, gradually. It's also a little bit abrupt in somewhere in the middle. Yeah, because it still interpolates magnitude. See, there is a region somewhere here in which suddenly there's a little bit of a jump because it's a region that actually goes to zero or sort of zero. Yeah. Good. Right. Can I say a little bit few words and then I'm done? Well, I didn't get any objection. <laughs> so yes. I object. I refute. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, this some hard. This is about, by the way, some methods will do those constraints in a hard way, which is actually what I did now. I actually put numbers on face, the red faces, and these are numbers. You interpolate them. It's not necessarily. Sometimes you want to put those numbers in the energy, 
okay? So you want to steal the mesh to go through these kind of things, but not necessarily, maybe it prefers to be a little bit more parallel or something of the sort, but don't, because, because I put really bad constraints, don't kill the entire of the mesh. Sort of, it depends how soft you make them. And last technical words before I go to questions. Specifically in Cartesian method, again, like you, what you showed us, there's a trivial solution. Okay, you have to have constraints. If I don't have constraints, I want to give, give me the smoothest field. I don't get the smoothest field. One possibility to do this, and this was done by Knoppel and others, is to say, well, I don't want to minimize the energy. I want to take the first eigenvalue of the energy. So you get something, which is like the smoothest energy without any constraint, in a way. Uh, but be careful about this. But I'm reiterating it because it's, as you saw in the demos, it's even worse. Even if you put one constraint, it's not really enough because it's, the constraint is nice, but then all way over the other side of the mesh, you suddenly zeros appear. Or things not zero entirely, but close enough to zero to make it bad. Okay, so constraints are necessary. And depends what kind of constraints you do. So, one thing you can do is just polarizing the Cartesian in some way, is to say, well, we want the vector fields to be unit length. So that's okay. It's kind of, why are you not working polar in this case? Because it's any over and nonlinear, but still. This was used in ancient times. One other way is, one other way is just what I said in a few words, to say, well, the total norm of the vector field sums up to something which is not zero. That's a very, a little bit fancy word to say I took the first eigenvector in any kind of way, okay? So I'm taking the least energy such that the entire norm of the vector field is constant. Right. Another way to put it, which is not a way to handle it, is just glossing over the problem. And this is actually what you've seen in the demo, put enough constraints, okay? It's, I'm putting it here because um, this is a little bit more of a mathematical problem than an actual practical one. I mean, nobody wants just the smoothest vector fields on a mesh. You always want something, alignment or something of the sort. You always draw stuff, and then you get a directional. So it's kind of a not actual practical problem, but it is a mathematical problem yet. And it is a practical problem if you're only illustrating like the top of the mesh and neglect to do the bottom, and then the bottom suddenly does weird stuff. So enough hard constraints means not only enough, means well distributed. That's more even the problem which is not solved. It's a problem of Cartesian methods. That's it. Okay? <laughs> Questions? How do the different computational methods compare? And as far as I uh, understand it, every type of constraint you want to impose leads to some completely different approach to, uh, to solving the, the problem. What is it? Yes. The cooking re recipe that you can like... Uh, well, it, it, it was kind of short to give a recipe. In the actual course notes, we give actual recipes, but it's not a single answer, single question. I mean, it's kind of, I, I present it like the advantages and disadvantages. So it's more of the question of like, do I care more about the advantage than the disadvantage? Then if so, yes, choose this. Okay, for instance, if you want this is a linear system, something like really easy and cheap, you would choose a Cartesian system. If you don't care about where, to, where singularities fall, for instance. If you need to have specific singularities or control rotations above the sampling level, then you will need a polar method. That's usually the decision people will make in this case, okay? It is a problem that we cannot like combine, like saying I want both this and this to some extent, well, you will have to just combine them to some extent algorithmically. There's no one method uh, that fits everything here. So it's like, like, like two different main approaches, like yes. uh, one for Cartesian, one for Polar? Exactly. Or? exactly. That, that's how it's the state of the art is today. They're not, they don't mix much. Unless they mix like in an algorithm, you just do this and then that. But there's no method which is kind of both in a way, because it's hard. Like, uh, the, the, the problem is that the, dis the disadvantages interlock. Yeah, so if you try to uh, use one, you kill the advantages of the other. Yes, yes. So, so actually, 
question or comment about that. So it's, it's interesting because in all the hexahedral methods, people are happy to say, okay, we do something cheap and linear to initialize, then we do something more expensive. Yes. And that doesn't really get discussed in the surface case, but it certainly applies as well. So for instance, so you could take, yeah, I mean, you could take an efficient linear method and then use that as initialization for full event. But this is something that's never really discussed. No, but in general, 3D is not really discussed about anything. No, 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 I but mean, I'm not talking about 3D, right? I guess what I'm saying is we can learn from the 3D case in the surface case and simply say, okay, do the eigenvalue problem for the initialization. Now there's some artifacts you don't like. Okay, now use that as an initial guess for the polar case. Yes, the problem is that we don't have a polar method here for 3D at all. No, but I'm not talking about 3D. So I'm only talking about 2D yes. services. Yeah, yeah. I think the difference is topology control, right? Like in 2D, sure. you can get a really good initial answer. And so I mean, I think we agree with you. Yes. We actually have more hope of success in the 2D case exactly. using pipeline like the, the right. Really exactly. Right. You that's what I'm saying. It's, 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 not then. Oh, it's not really a fight between polar and Cartesian <laughs> in the 2D case. It's more like Cartesian could be the initializer. And yeah, that's what I meant by mixing the algorithm. I mean, you do one and then you do the other. It's possible, but again, in some cases, the Cartesian doesn't give a very good initialization. Like, if the constraints are too, too not like each other, and it gives this Voronoi appearance where this is totally flat, and then suddenly a region of something else totally flat. So, I would be careful in doing this statement. Yeah.